me get myself mic'd properly. This is a brown ale. That's Yeah, it's that simple. I was told there was excellent free pop here. Yes. <laughs> yes, free pop. So what was this again? It's a brown ale. No, it's just a brown ale. It's from, it is not all grain. Um, it's a Best Yet, which is a company out of Kent, Ohio, kit. So it's, it, it's a, a blended kit in terms of, comes in a little box, is relatively inexpensive to make a $5 batch. You should start recording because this is kind yeah, of the beginning of my. Actually. Okay, good. I'm um, tasting a weird like sugar, in it, like a brown sugar. Like at the very end. Nope, nothing weird in it at all. I'm not a beer drinker. And this is awesome. It's really good. That's why you should brew your own beer because five gallons, which is a little more than two cases of beer, for twenty six bucks for the ingredients. About would you spend, Colonel, about a hundred bucks for the equipment I had you buy? Yeah, for all the startup stuff and, and stuff. yeah, but you don't need that. Yeah. That depends on how you want to drink. But we'll start at the beginning. This kit to make a red ale, which is a red ale, same quality as what you guys are drinking, costs 26 bucks. It includes some malt extract, which is essentially the hard part of brewing your own beer, making this. This is dried malt sugar, essentially. Dump that. And the kit also comes with roasted grains. Um, this is where these, this is what makes these kits better than a lot of the other just brew your own homebrew, is you actually do get a bag of grains and you make tea with this. And this is where the good flavor that, that these kits comes from, as opposed to just the extract or the hopped extract. Because some of the homebrew kits that you get will, will just give you a can of stuff. And that can is a can of malt extract pre-hopped and you just kind of rehydrate it like making orange juice in the pot and then ferment it. And those just aren't as good. This is closer to how a real brewery is doing it, which would be a real brewery would start with 10 pounds of this and make the beer from that and a lot more water and, but that takes eight to ten hours to brew because you have to not boil it but keep it hot and it get all the sugar out of the of the roasted grains <coughs> essentially what you're doing when you do a kit like this fill a pot up with a couple gallons of water make tea with the grains so in the 170 degree range doesn't matter too much not boiling you boil it, it burns, and it can't drink the beer. <laughs> Have you tried? Uh, I haven't had the misfortune of burning any of the grains yet, but I have some friends who brew using propane outside, and it's much harder to regulate the temperature on the propane, and so, oops. <laughs> and they burned it, and it wasn't drinkable beer. When you make the tea, you add the hop, the malt, and then bring it up to a boil, and you drop it in. These kits come with pelletized hops. Um, the pelletized hops are not as good as fresh hops, but they're a little bit more controlled. So it's easier to, for them to measure out how much hops is really going to end up in there. Um, fresh hops is, a hops is a flower, and so it looks a little bit like weed in a flower, so you get an actual bud, and, um, and these are then pelletized and crushed. And that's what gives beer its aroma and was originally used as a preservative when they first made beer. I'm going to get out some hops and pass it around and you, you guys will all recognize the, the beer smell from hops. Yeah, it's a little old. It's been in there and you just smell it. And it just kind of smells the way a good beer smells and the way this smells. Because it, it has a fairly large amount of fresh hops. Once you have that in there, it's boiling. Cook it for 55 minutes. And then you dump in another round of hops. And that adds the aroma because it's not cooked for a long time. 
And that's what gives it the, the beer smell. Once it's all cooked and everything, you're only cooking it for an, for an hour. So it takes about an hour and a half to get a batch done cooking between heating up the water and making the tea part. It takes about an hour and a half. Then you cool it down. I usually just dump it in the sink. Well, not dump it in the sink, but put the pot in the sink in cold water bath to cool it off quickly. Once it gets down to a reasonable temperature, you dump it into one of these big glass jugs. These are a six and a half gallon jug. Generally, you put about two gallons of what's called a wort, which is what that is after it's been cooked, into your jug and strain it. What the straining does is those pelletized hops kind of disintegrate and turn into a gunk. You really want to filter that gunk out because you don't want it in your beer. You end up with enough gunk already from the dead yeast. Once it's in here, you fill the rest of it up with water. I just use tap water. You can use fancier water and it's not a, but the beer that I make tastes fine. That's just Kent City tap water. <laughs> Once it's in here, get it to a reasonable temperature. When you buy one of these, they're like 20 bucks. Hold six and a half gallons of liquid. And so you gotta figure out how much five gallons is, mark it. There's a magic, uh, magic marker line on here that you can't see. And the one on here has been washed off. But mark it. You can barely see the remains of the line. <laughs> and fill it up to that. Make sure you buy a strip thermometer so you can know what temperature it's at. These thermometers are marked with temperature ranges. Um, ales should be brewed between 66 and 70, 72 degrees. So house temperature. That's useful. You can just sit it in, in your closet and it should be fine in terms of temperature. Once it's adjusted to that temperature, because you're, when you get the hot stuff from cooking it and you pour cold water in there, the temperature will be all over the place. Let it sit for a couple hours and then the temperature will settle down to within the range and add yeast. A lot of I've gotten out of the habit of buying liquid yeast. One of the things you can do to very improve your quality is buy a liquid yeast, which is, this is a packet of yeast that looks like baking yeast. So it's dry, it looks pretty much identical to the baking yeast you use to make bread. Um, you can buy a liquid yeast that is not in a freeze-dried form, so it's alive. And in theory, that will start the batch faster so because it's alive. It doesn't need to be reconstituted. It'll be more successful in preventing wild yeast infestation because when this is first dumped in there, it is a nice temperature sugar water solution. There isn't really much better things for growing yeast in. Um, so you've got to be relatively careful about steril sterilization. That's the advantage of using glass. You can put all kinds of crazy chemicals in here to clean it out and get it actually clean. A lot of the kits will sell you something like that ale pail down there, which is plastic, and it just doesn't clean well. It's even been there for a week, and you can see the crusty line that gets around here because it foams up and bubbles and n not, not good in plastic. It just doesn't ever come out right. And then it's stained, and then it smells funny after a while, and then it smells and tastes funny. Too much hair in the microphone. So liquid yeast is better, but it costs four or five bucks a batch, and so I tend not to use it because I'm cheap. Uh, dry yeast, constitute it in warm water, and you get and dump it into the jug. A week later, you get something that looks like this. Somewhere during the next day, after you put it in there, it should start bubbling here, meaning the yeast is reproducing by producing carbon dioxide and alcohol. Um, you keep it in an airlock so it doesn't get contaminations from outside air. You don't get wild yeast infections. Um, but the carbon dioxide can come out that the yeast makes when it produces alcohol. After about a week, you can see you get, there's a pretty large amount of sediment in the bottom. And this is dead yeast. That's why almost always Get a new mic. Um, you can leave that one on. Now. Okay. It's just for the video. Oh. 
I get two inks. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> That's why I, I almost always move it to a secondary stage and give it a week in here to do all the most of the converting sugar to alcohol and then dump all the stuff except the crap on the bottom into another fermenter and let it sit for another couple weeks. That means this doesn't end up in the bottle, bottom of your cup at the end when you drink it. So you've kind of got to pay attention to how much you dump it out of there. To that, that the only yeah, that'll give it a funny taste too. Um, and you need to leave it fermenting longer. It also makes it easier to clean if you don't leave it like this for, because until yesterday, the day before, there was an inch or two of foam up on the top of here where this residue is. And that goes away, and the sooner I open that all up and clean off that, the easier it is to do. To the end of not bringing the stuff and not stirring all that up, almost always you transfer it by a siphon. So you get a hard tube, you stick down there, and you stand around with it yay about there inside and drain it into the other one. It doesn't stir up all the residue on the bottom. You can actually get everything out without messing it. The only time I really dump it is when I'm putting it in there from, from the wart and then I'm filtering it because I don't do a filter stage at the end. The only filtration I do is making sure all the hops doesn't end up in the jug. Once, once it's in the secondary fermenting stage, you can really leave it there for as long as you want. As long as you keep um, water in the airlock, it'll sit there for a month and it'll be okay. Much more than two or three months, the beer will start to get old and won't be as good. Um, but it kind of depends on how lazy you are. Because the bottling or whatever happens at the end is the most work. Lots of cleaning, lots of mess being made. Um, that's kind of the next thing to talk about is, well, you guys have any questions about actually getting to that stage? What's the company you bought your kit from? Um, Grape and Granary. It's in Akron, Ohio. They have a pretty nice website. Um, that's, they, I prefer to buy this kind of stuff in the store because then you make sure you're getting the right kind of stuff. You can always, I get the kits mail order because. I did find a local store around here, if anyone's interested in down there right on Mayfield, down towards the company. Okay. There's also a Rosie's Wine House in uh, Lakewood. Yeah. Do they sell beer making stuff as well? Yeah. <coughs> I like, we have a place where I live. Because you get tapped into like other breweries. Yeah. You get advice. Yeah. You somebody can call and say, dude, it smells like skunks. <laughs> right. Right. There's definitely. Um, there was a. A lot of little, like, it sounds like all the shops are their own little sub communities. It's like this. Yeah, and that kind of thing, it's all, well, I've never done it before. How does it work? It's not, you, you want to make sure you're buying the right products and make sure you, you just need somebody to talk to to make sure it's the right stuff for you, that you're going to like the kind of beer you're ordering. I mean, because they have kits, all different kinds. I mean, this in here right now is a porter. There's a red ale, and what's in here is a brown ale. What's in my secondary fermenter at home is a, uh, uh, Dos Equis clone. So you just make all different kinds of beer. Um, you got to make sure you pick something you like. Because even if it's good beer, if it's not a style you like, well, you just wasted 30 bucks. You might find somebody to get drink it, but in general. Yeah. Can you use baking yeast? Um, yes. It won't turn out as well. Because there. These are actually a strain of yeast designed for this style of beer. Um, I worked in a bakery and we used to get the hard yeast to pound cubes. And he got it from Budweiser's. Yeah, I mean, you can use the yeast, um, but they are typed out for different styles of beer, in theory. You can also save this sediment and put it in a bottle and cap it and use it next time you make a batch. You don't have to buy liquid yeast every time. Just keep it in the fridge, you know, the sludge, because the sludge in the bottom is some dead yeast, but a lot of just sunk to the bottom yeast. And if you give it a little bit of sugar, seal it up, but make sure you give it a real little so the bottle doesn't explode. 
you can keep the keep the yeast from the previous batches. Um, Budweiser um, it has a very large yeast library. The, uh, they actively go out and uh, acquire other companies' yeasts, which is a trade. It's kind of a trade asset. And so there's a guy who lives in England who works for Budweiser. And his, they use open top fermenters there. So what happens is he's wearing a tie. And he goes over to take a good smell of the yeast in the fermenter. And he leans over, way over. And his tie will dip in the yeast. And he's already sterilized his tie beforehand. So after his little tour is done, he'll take it. And he'll get the yeast off that. And that's what they'll use for their yeast library. And that's enough to culture it. And that is a big trade secret and because a lot of what makes a beer taste a certain way or taste good versus bad is the yeast. Yeah. It's more good versus bad than what make it taste a certain way. Well, bad yeast, if, you know. If you drink a lot, I used to work for a brewery which did open top fermenting, which all the yeasts for all the beers are the, it's the same yeast and it's all done in a sealed room. Um, and this is really, this is kind of going to gross some people out, but. The people that work in that room, the way their body chemicals affect the yeast affects the way the beers taste. So there's no sticky people allowed in the room or that work in there on a regular basis and stuff like that. It's really weird. But it does totally, like across the line, you can hit these same flavor notes. That's why I like yeah. certain beers, like a lot of contract, there's something called contract brewing, where one brewery will hire another brewery to make their beer. They really are very sensitive about getting their yeast mixed. It, 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 it's, it's a strange thing. And I have good yeast in my house. Just four years of brewing, I haven't had a contaminated yeast batch yet. And then I have, because I have the good yeast spread around enough, I actually would have difficulty getting contamination and even though I have toddlers that help me brew beer sometimes, um, I haven't had contamination problems. Meaning cleanliness is not the top of my list because I have, I have good yeast and I, I don't need to worry about as much. I've done some open top fermenting of fruited meads because usually you do open top fermenting with um, wines and meads be because of the fruit in them. You do the fruit and filter it off. That's more complicated and much, much more problematic. Open top is scary. But it's, 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 it's very, if you, a lot of English yeah. beers open top, it's really, it's very, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's right. Yeah, you know, it's just scary. It's camp I come from, yeah. But it's very common where I, in Vermont, mm -hmm. and it's really good. I mean, it's really, it's pretty It's good or it's bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what, what we did is we went from being, we also did, uh, the way that, this is, isn't this the, the you should, this is, this is a sealed vessel style mm -hmm. fermentation, which is, yeah. which you use like. Uh, An airlock which they use in Germany a lot. And they use it in, um, in the, for like Budweiser and a lot of other beers. And we started doing that for one of our beers. Um, but they, and there was a big worry that it would destroy the company because it would destroy our yeast. We'd have a, a contamination right. issue. And it would just destroy the open top facility. I don't know if, I don't know how that would affect. I mean, I haven't made open top beer um, because I don't want to waste the whole batch. I mean, there is a contamination is a pretty big issue, and you need a place where y you can keep the room reasonably clean. Right now, this sits in the bit corner of my basement. My basement leaks sometimes, and you know, I got little kids and laundry done down there, blowing dust all around, and it's n not a good place to do that kind of thing. But there are good places. You know, if you can have a closet where you can seal up the doors to make sure the door is sealed, you can do that. And it would turn out fine. And it would probably turn out better than something like this. Because yeast does, there's lots and lots of little things with home brewing that make it taste better. It is really easy to make a batch that tastes fine. It tastes better than Budweiser. It tastes better than you could buy commercial beer for with the money you spent. It's hard to make it taste incredible. I've tried lots and lots of different additives using Irish moss, using um, water, water hardeners, using different water. And in the end, it's very difficult to tell the beer apart. And the best batches I ever made, I don't have any idea why they were better than the other batches using exactly the same recipe. It gets into two things. One is a lot of logging. That's the thing that we, that we yeah. get a lot of. I mean, there was so much log data collected, it wasn't even funny. 
And you need to, because there's lots of different variables. And I, I don't. I, I don't log very well at all, because the beer I make tastes good enough, and I'm OK with that. And, and the other thing is that we had, we had like, wine tasting groups and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing, is learning how to taste beers. And that's a really fun learning experience. You also have to have carryover from previous batches, which I don't always do. Sometimes it all gets drunk before the next one of that kind is ready. <laughs> Um, and that kind of takes any more questions about that st those steps? Because the next thing is what you want to do with your beer after it's ready to be put in something to drink in. And there's a lot of different choices I've been through. I mean, right now I'm using a soda keg system, which is the easiest but most expensive and least portable. I have a lot of crap here related to that. Um, soda kegs. You need a five pound CO2 or bigger. So this is carbon dioxide that's fed through a regulator, which also costs money through tubing, and then into your beer. And then you can feed off of it with a relatively inexpensive tap. These are available on eBay for reasonably cheap. I think two for like 25 bucks, including shipping. So reasonably cheap, because they're essentially surplus property. Um, you can, you do need to watch out because there are two different styles. There, the pin lock and the ball lock. So when you're buying them, make sure you get, you get the right kind. Um, this is, because these used to hold soda syrup, so Coke, Pepsi. So you couldn't share the empties, which they reuse between the two different companies. They have two different systems for attaching them. I don't really know which one is better. These were available cheaper on eBay when Colonel Panic was buying them. <laughs> the only difference in them is uh, Coke doesn't want Pepsi using their kegs and vice versa, so yeah. they make a different connection. Yeah, you know, you know how the world is. Um, like these can be replaced? Yeah, but then you got to get the fittings and you got to make sure you don't leave a pressure leak because it is a little tricky. These, when I'm carbonating it, I put up to 20 pounds of pressure in there, and that's kind of a lot of pressure for these kind of containers, especially since they were like, tw you know, 1250 used, including shipping. Um, <laughs> and so. I've, I mean, I've had leak issues in terms of, you know, s pressurized and slow beer all over my basement floor because I didn't pay attention and it just bubbled out the, you know, bubbled out here because it was under pressure until it wasn't under pressure anymore and then all the beer was on the floor, <laughs> which sucked. Um, these are a fun solution if you're going to have a relatively permanent setup at home and you don't want to deal with bottling. The downside to this is it is very difficult for me to give my beer away. It is very difficult for me to bring a six pack to a picnic or, or whatever. I get a, a truckload of beer or no beer. Um, relatively easy to fill, relatively easy to clean. You gotta make sure you clean them with the iodine cleaner stuff that they sell for cleaning these. The regular beer cleaning stuff, which is some kind of scary disinfectant stuff. You will make these leak. Trust me. It will. Do, it does something to the rubber in them, and they just leak instantaneously, or near instantaneously. But you need iodine-based keg cleaning stuff, and that disinfects the the kegs. The next, I guess, the next also expensive but easier to deal with solution is you've probably seen things this size at. The store carrying, I don't remember what sells in it now, but I think Molson, they sell them in the, hmm? Heineken. 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 Foster's. Foster's, yeah. Five liters, you can get a tap system for them. So this is, this takes, this takes the CO2 cylinders, and you screw it in here and it pops them. And then you get a tap system for these. Five liters at a time, so you end up doing like four of these for a whole batch of beer and then a six pack of bottles. 
that is kind of useful, but this is a very expensive system to run because you tend to use one or two of those CO2 things um, for every single jug, and they're like 75 cents each, and that adds up quick. And then the jugs are like eight bucks, or you can drink a thing of Heineken and reuse it. Um, and then this is like 60 or 80 bucks. And so, yeah, this is, well, this whole setup is like 120. Yeah, for the, for the jug. Yeah. But this is also a lot cheaper to refill. This is five pounds of CO2. It'll do about, it'll do more than 10 of these for eight bucks in CO2. So, to, and you just take it there and get it refilled. Very inconvenient if you run out during the weekend because the places that do these tend to be welding shops and have like eight to 4.30 hours. That part sucks. Um, smaller and easier than that, probably the easiest solution is these bottles. They're kind of expensive to buy, or you can just drink a bunch of beer that comes in the gross bottles. But your only real expense is occasionally getting new rubber gaskets. You're supposed to do it every time, but you don't need to. Just clean them, and they're fine. They make these in all kinds of sizes, and they're pretty... They're pretty nice because you can reseal it. When you're actually putting the beer in the bottles, it's not carbonated by CO2. So you either need to reserve some of your wort or add um, corn sugar in order to sweeten it up a little bit so that the yeast goes to town again and produces your bubbles. That's how, if you add what they call priming sugar, which comes with the kits, um, I believe it's corn. It's a very potent powder that dissolves very easily, and then you're no longer making Bavarian purity law beer, but who cares? It doesn't really affect the taste that much. Um, you don't have to use it if you use one of the systems that carbonate by CO2 from a jug. The other option, which is incredibly tedious to do two cases of these, is regular bottles. Easy to get plenty of these. I never had to pen. I just asked my family, hey, can I have some bottles? And I think I have 10 cases of bottles in my basement. Um, I like Corona bottles because I can see when they're clean, when I'm washing them. Lots of people don't because light does damage the beer over time. So you've got to keep the beer in a dark place if you're using clear bottles. But then you can really see if it's clean. And that's awful useful because... You have a party, you always end up with bottles with cigarette butts in the bottom. There's just nothing that's going <laughs> to... Nothing's going to stop that. If you're going to put it in bottles, you need to get one of these. It's a bottle capper. These are like 30 or 40 bucks, so it's another expense. Um, the Best Yet kits come with priming sugar and with caps. So I, I probably have a thousand caps at home because I'm not bottling anymore with this. This is pretty easy to do. It's just going to take you about two hours, and you're going to make a giant mess. Because you've got to, from one of these, gradually siphon into a bunch of these until they're about yay filled up, you know, until about, into about 50 of these until they're about yay filled up, and then cap them all without spraying beer everywhere. That gets old fast. That's why, the, that's why I have all the <laughs> other solutions, because I got tired of bottling. Questions? I answered all your questions? Okay. More beer? <laughs> How much should you budget for like, the, the very first time you want to like, try it? 120 what, bucks. What I told Colonel Panic, who I recently took him to the store to buy all this stuff, was buy one of these, buy an airlock, buy a secondary fermenter, glass five gallon one of these, smaller so there's less air in it after the fact. Get one of these things. I think, and then get a bottling solution, whatever you want to do. Um, bottling solutions vary a lot in cost depending on what you want to do. Um, from this kind of a solution, which really out the door you're talking 200 bucks, to this kind of solution, which you can do for 30 bucks because all you got to buy is one of these. 
Um, yeah, that's, and then you need to spend 30 bucks on the ingredients. So about, so about 150 or 120? Um, you spent 120, didn't you? Uh, on the equipment. On the equipment, yeah. but that was excluding the bottling system because he already had bought that because the biggest advantage of these is you can get one of these things. This lets you hook it up to commercial kegs. So you can run CO2 on commercial kegs. Obviously, it won't do um, some of the expensive foreign beers, but whatever domestic beer you want, including most microbrews. So you can get a, a fifth of Great Lakes and hook it up to one of this and have the same size jug of Great Lakes on tap with your homebrew. I can, my CO2 system, I can run three different kinds of beer at once. One, I only have set up to run one commercial and two homebrew. Colonel Panic bought the stuff to do. You can do two commercial and one homebrew. Have you ever used uh, nitrogen? No. It's expensive. It is. It's, it's pretty good. It's good with porters. Is it? Yeah. We, one of the beers that we did, we, we uh, did with porters. And it was, it was pretty good. Very good. What would the difference in the process be like if you were going to try wine? Wine, um, I've made mead before, which is a pretty similar process to wine. Wine takes lots, lots longer. Um, you, there's a clarifying process you go through with wine because you don't really care if your beer is a little cloudy. But with wine, you need to repeatedly make sure all the sed sediment is taking out. So with wine, you cook it whatever the directions are. You can get a kit, it'll come with a recipe and you follow those directions. And then you need two fermenters and you just pass it back and forth between the fermenters once a week until it's as clear as you want it to be um, after the primary fermenting is done. Because it's a higher alcohol content, it also takes a little bit longer to get to the primary fermenting. And there's a lot more chance for contamination because it's a longer period of time. One of the things a lot of people do with wine is they use Camden tablets, which are a safe to people way to kill all the yeast in a batch so that you can knock out any wild yeast contamination and actually s make sure your wine isn't going to ferment anymore. That's how you can have a wine that's sweet at all without having 90 percent, well, you know, 18 percent alcohol. How many different keg tops are there from the commercial kegs? I think there's two or three. Most domestic come with the, this is a, with this kind, which is a pin lock. No, it was like, I think they, I don't remember. Remember what this is called? That one? Um, yeah. Ball. ball. Ball lock keg. And, and I know Guinness has a different kind, and I believe Bass has a different kind. I don't, I don't know what they are, but... Um, this will get you plenty of good beers, just buying one of these. You can buy all the crappy domestic beers, and you can get, well, the only one I've gotten like this is Great Lakes. You can, all their products come like this. And there's, you know. It's good yeah, it's good enough. Because I can get them in fifths. That's the other nice thing about this. Great Lakes comes, hmm? Why is your beer better than mine? I don't know. <laughs> beer likes me. I, I don't know. I mean, is it significantly better? Uh, we'll see. We'll see. The, um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, one those, it's all about practice. Like, it's, so, it's so hard to do it. For, I, I tried doing it. I was like, this is awful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see? I was comparing it with like, what our brewmaster makes. Yeah, that's He's true. A professional brewer. Like, from I haven't brewer. made stuff that's like awful. I haven't... I mean... I make beer pretty drunk a lot. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, that's one of those things. I invite a bunch of people over and make a batch of beer. That's why my regulator is broken, because I was trying to carbonate beer drunk <laughs> after making a batch of beer, and it fell off the... Yeah, and he got a beer shower. <laughs> Yes. I, I went through like five or six of these like this. Who wants some beer? 
this has this has advantages of convenience and portability that the bigger ones do. So really, on uh, your first batch of beer, is it? I mean, was yours? Uh, did it get progressively better at a point? I haven't noticed it getting progressively better. I have a. <coughs> I have made batches that I don't know why, but were stellar. And I've made ba most of my batches are like this. This is definitely drinkable. It's probably not the best beer you've ever had, but it is not a bad home brew, and it's better than Budweiser. I mean, you know, I mean, it's. And this has got a little bit of a funny taste from sitting in the aluminum keg for like six weeks. I mean, it's just it's, it's essentially a big can. Beer and cans just taste funny after a while, so it gets a little bit of a funny taste from that. And then, then two questions: um, Is there any particular style of beer that would uh, be the easiest to, to do the first first time? And secondly, would, would, when you boil it, would it be would there be any difference in like doing a uh, like a steam boil where you have put the one pot inside of another one that's boiling water, so the steam causes the second one to boil? Um, I haven't, I don't know that that would make a difference. I don't think so. The goal isn't really to trap it. It just needs to be cooked um, to change the sugars. What was the first question? Uh, any particular recommendation on for what you the first time? Brown ale. Brown. Yeah. They're, the English brown ale kit from Best Jet is pretty hard to screw up, and it turns out pretty good. Um, they're red. I've made their red ale. I've made and it's been a lot better, but it's been a lot more variable. Sometimes it's been good, sometimes it's not been good. Um, and I think part of the reason why these kits turn out so well is they're made in Kent, so it's not like they're not that old when you get them off the shelf. I think that makes a difference too. Even vacuum sealed stuff, you know, this is a bag of grain and it will go stale after a while and just not taste as good. And the same with the hops. You could tell those hops, I'd had them in a little baggie for a while and they just, had lost a lot of their smell. Yeah. Because they're... Get fresh hops. Well, yeah, is. yeah. I have a hops plant in my yard, so that's one of the things I'm working on trying to get. But then you're back to, okay, how do I measure these? I don't really know. You know, I just bought them at the store. What kind are they? How, how are they really going to turn out? That's the advantage of those. You know how much hops you're going to get. I would have to experiment a lot and... The batch from last year probably going to be significantly different than the batch from this year, even though it's the same plant. Different hops. Different, there's different strains of hops, and they yeah. add very different flavors. And it's very, it's very variable and very interesting. Yeah. It's um, a lot of the complicated flavor from your beer comes from the hops. You had said that those, uh, those pills, they, they stop it so you don't get 80 proof wine. Well, y not 80 proof, well, but 15, yeah. What about with the beer? I mean, is it just going to... The beer uses all the sugar. Beer tastes bad if there's any sugar left. I mean, that's the wine. Sometimes you make either really dry wines where um, I don't have my hydrometer with me. Oh, yeah, I do. They make this measuring tool that is for the record keeping he's talking about so you can actually know things um, and record useful information. What this does is it's a weighted float that has a scale on it and allows you to measure how much alcohol is in your beer or how much sugar. And the way it works is at 60 degrees in water, it should float at the one mark. But if you add sugar to it, it will float higher. And then when, so what you, what you do if you're going to use this is you get your beer at the temperature when it matters or use an adjustment table because it's, you can adjust it based on what temperature the beer is. You float it in your beer and then you can measure how much sugar is in your beer. And then when it's done, you can measure that all the sugar is gone and it's been replaced by alcohol. Alcohol is slightly lighter than, sh than water by itself. So in a wine, in a super dry wine, it will actually read below one because all the sugar is gone, it's been replaced by alcohol, and it's lighter. But a sweet wine, it'll still be above one, because there's still sugar in there, and they killed off the sugar. That's why it tastes sweet. But sweet beer is bad, and that leads to exploding bottles and containers. Don't add caffeine to your beer. It's been done. Your bottles explode.
Ah. Exploding bottles are bad. But but the uh, but the experience of drinking beer and getting more and more excited as the night goes on is cool. Good. Can I have one? Yeah. <laughs> I think a little bit late. Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it I know the sugar determines how much alcohol content is in there, but mm -hmm. it converts the sugar to the alcohol, right? Yes. So it's, if you wanted to brew a batch that had anyway, a slightly higher um, alcohol content, would you use a different yeast or would you just use more sugar? It depends on how much sugar you added. There is a point where yeast dies because of alcohol, and there are strains of yeast like champagne yeast or different kinds of mead yeast that will die at different points. Um, so I've made meads that are sweeter, and they're sweeter because you put in 15 pounds of honey, and then your yeast dies off at 13% alcohol. And it's still plenty of sugar left in there, but all the yeast is dead because it, you know, died the way all of us would like to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Making. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be exiting probably just now saying my sketch. <laughs> hey, I'm not on duty. Here, let me give you a little more. I didn't fill it up here. Yeah. It's part of the presentation. <laughs> I'm presenting in an hour, so I'm probably going to get a little nervous about my job. I really, I really wish the foundation could fund this kind of stuff, unfortunately. But I'll help. <laughs> <laughs> So how difficult is it to clean some of this stuff? Um, the stuff in glass is not difficult. I have a big scrubby mm -hmm. thing that's long and goes down in there, and it's glass, and glass is just not bad to clean. I mean, if you um, get real... You get nasty stuff out of it, right? I mean, you can put really nasty stuff in your glass. And clean right. I mean, that's the other thing. This stuff that I use to clean it scares me. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's the label is avoid contact with eyes, skin, and clothing. Avoid breathing dust. For skin contact, wash with water. You know, flush. If swallowed, do not induce vomit. Drink large quantities of water, of water and call your doctor. You know, I mean, <laughs> it is relatively scary stuff. Um, it's an oxid, it's an oxidizer, so it's neutral there, but you add it to water and air, and it does weird stuff that kills everything. How would, how would you It doesn't make the cleaning bad. Um, it will affect the taste of your beer. One of the things that I don't think I have any. Oh, yeah. I mean, people add, I've added, one of the additives I've used is gypsum, which is essentially water hardener. Um, you can, that's one of the things that I'm sure they recorded in the brewery is how hard the water was and a lot of properties up about the water. Yeah, because it does make a difference. And we just use iron content and such. Yeah. Do you ever use uh, sturgeon bladder for filtration? Mm -mm. It works really well. It's, you know, it's, it's not vegetarian anymore, but it, it, it's weird. Like you, it's like a powder. Mm -hmm. You put it in, it just like grabs all the yeast and just like seems like a rock to the bottom. What, what is it called? Sturgeon bladder. So it does. So, so someone was like, "Oh, how are we going to get this yeast out?" Oh, chuck the sturgeon bladder. In. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, the settler I use is Irish moss. And you do that during the boil, and that really just helps get all the, um, especially since I use pelletized um, hops, it helps settle out all the pelletized hops so that I can strain those out better. Um, because the, yeah, that, that's where a lot of the yuckiness, and that's one of the places that I've improved is particulate matter in the bottom of the, of the bottle. That's... It's an aesthetic thing. Well, it tastes bad, too. It's nice to be able to finish the whole bottle without having to leave yay much on the bottom. How fine, how fine would you uh, filter stuff out after the boil? Um, not that fine. I don't care that much about it. A little bit makes a big difference, and there's a lot of good stuff that, you know, I don't want to filter it 
I don't filter it through a cheese cloth. I mean, you can see this is the strainer. So it's, yeah. It's not like the micron filter. No, no. And I accelerate it through that. You know, so I have a flat surface that I rub on that to make it go through faster. And I'm sure that pushes plenty of stuff. Is that just nylon? Yeah. Yeah. And it hasn't melted either, which sometimes surprises me. Because sometimes I'm pouring stuff through here pretty hot. What is the um, it's called Easy Clean No Rinse. Let's see. How many bottles is that roughly? Two, it's like 50 bottles. So it's a little bit more than two cases. Um, <laughs> you'll get tired of bottling fast. Um, have you used uh, growlers? Yeah, but they're really expensive. Really? How much do you pay for growlers? I don't know. More than I pay for these. The glass? We're talking about the glass? Yeah, like one of these? Growlers no, no, no. Growlers, half gallon. Oh, the big ones. Like a moonshine I, ha I only have one of those, and I use those for... Um, they're good for parties. You can just take it out of the keg. Yeah, I have one of those to take out of the keg. I, I don't, it was given to me. I don't know how much it cost. Yeah. Yeah. And those are really great, actually. But they're good for carding paint. You can't store beer anymore. You can store beer. Yeah. yeah you the seal is... The, you got to make sure. Yeah, you just crank it on. We, at the work, we got in a lot every week of three growlers, which is a gallon and a half, or a case of beer. Mm-hmm. Um, three and, growlers. You know, it's a lot of beer, actually. Like, yeah. Um, and those, and those, I, I would keep in my fridge. There would be a point where I would have six or eight growlers in the fridge. I'd be like, okay, who's coming over the chill? My, my fridge is kind of scary because I have half the shelf taken out, so I can put kegs in it. Making a kegerator is fun. Yeah. Somebody gave me a dorm fridge, and so it wasn't big enough to fit these in, but it would fit the food that it wouldn't fit my fridge when I put one in my fridge. <laughs> And I had the, I have the half style shelves in my fridge, so I just took out half the shelves. And then this came out of my fridge this morning on the way up, you know, pulled out of my fridge and put it in. And the other reason for bringing it is it kind of needs to get drunk because I have one in the secondary that I'd like to go in my fridge, and this has been in there for like two months, so time to finish it. Yeah. Cake stands in the room. No beer bong. This isn't keg stand beer. <laughs> yes. One for the videographer. Mm hmm. I lost a microphone or something, yeah. Anything else? Okay. So one thing I'd say is 